breakdown. Don't miss our post-game show coming up tomorrow after Game 3. It will be a great one. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter because we have a great conversation every day. Well, let's talk a little bit about Game 2 because there's an internet meme about how well LeBron James played in Game 2, and I want to dispel that myth because for much of this game, he wasn't very good. He did not shoot well, he turned the ball over a little bit, and he didn't have the same kind of effect on the game that he normally does. Now, I don't want to take away from the amazing plays he did have that really turned the game, but let's just make sure we understand what the whole body of work was. It wasn't so great up until that point. Mano Ginobili has had a lot of trouble with his ball handling all playoff long, and it came to a head in this game where he really hurt the Spurs with his inability to make easy passes and dribble the ball. Tim Duncan also had some trouble down low and didn't score as well. So there's some hope for Spurs fans going back to San Antonio that those two players will get back on the right track. Dwayne Wade has been still playing pretty poorly. He didn't shoot that great. He didn't really make a lot of plays, a little bit, but not what they need to win a championship. They got game two with it because the other guy stepped up, but they're going to need Dwayne Wade to play even better. But let's start by looking at LeBron James' overall game. LeBron shot very poorly for most of this game, hitting only two of his first 12 shots. However, on this post-up, his team still benefited from LeBron collapsing the defense. Kawhi Leonard did an outstanding job on LeBron, even in horns, where LeBron has much of his success. He is able to withstand this isolation and force him into a tough shot and miss. And on this wrinkle out of horns, LeBron attacks the lane with Danny Green guarding him, gets away with lowering his shoulder on an offensive charge, yet can't finish a short shot in the lane. While his shooting and rebounding numbers were off, he did find ways to get shots for his teammates, finishing with seven assists. However, there was a stretch in the third quarter where something was bothering him, perhaps his knee. He can't finish the layup off his left foot in the open court, got blocked in the low post by Danny Green, and even though he made this layup, it looked like he had no lift on that right leg. The Spurs had trouble to start this game hitting the roll man and Manu in particular could not seem to handle the ball very well. He fumbled the ball no less than 12 times in this game. Some of them weren't turnovers, but it disrupted the important rhythm of the Spurs offense. And when he wasn't fumbling his dribble around the court, he was having trouble with accuracy on his passes. He just seemed a second late on everything. Like here, he should quickly hit Duncan who is rolling to the hoop and wide open. Instead, he forces the drive, loses the ball, and lets the Heat come back with a full head of steam, eventually finding Ray Allen for a crushing three. The Heat were also doing their usual add a whole new offensive set in the middle of the playoff series thing. The new play in game two was to dribble the ball into the corner, then get a ball screen. In seven possessions, they scored nine points for a healthy 1.3 points per possession. The Spurs, on the other hand, are a model of consistency on their offensive sets as they run the loop for Parker into a post-up for Duncan, who also shot very poorly in this game. Interestingly, the Heat took a page from the Spurs playbook and ran the loop for Ray Allen. Manu knows the play and denies the ball to Ray Allen, and when Cole has to break into the secondary option, the Spurs force the turnover. Let's turn to the crucial turning point of his game. The Heat unveiled a new wrinkle to their offense, a simple ball screen at the corner of the foul line. Not giving Chalmers enough attention, he forces the issue and gets the and one. Manu continued his troubles by firing a pass that sails on him and Neil can't corral it. Here's that elbow ball screen with LeBron we showed earlier. No one on the strong side to rotate to help and Duncan is late. This time they run it with Ray Allen in the strong side corner and LeBron sets the screen to the outside. While it's okay for Gary Neal to stunt towards LeBron, he should be focused on getting right back to Miller. Instead he pauses for half a second and that's all the daylight Miller needs. Same configuration again, but this time LeBron sets an inside ball screen. LeBron hadn't screened the ball a lot up till now, so it was confusing to the Spurs defense. They weren't sure whether to guard Chalmers or stick with LeBron. Kawhi does neither very well and Chalmers gets the three-point play. It just wasn't Manu's night. While this turnover isn't his fault, it was a good example of how he wasn't in sync with his teammates. And yet another subtle example of Manu being off. 
Had this pass not forced Gary Neal to jump for it, he gets a clean look at the hoop. Instead, Mike Miller recovers and puts intense pressure on him and he turns it over. The Spurs recognized how poorly LeBron was shooting and gave him as much space as possible. Notice how Kawhi goes under these screens, but LeBron wisely does not take the bait and maneuvers for a much easier mid-range two. With the game slipping away, the Spurs needed a great shot in the worst way. With Manu already in the midst of a horrible game, they run some flex action and he takes a terrible long three early in the shot clock. With LeBron coming around the outside of that screen, Manu could have easily drove the ball to his left, sucked Mike Miller in and kicked it out to an open Neal who was shooting well from three. Because it was such a quick shot, Kawhi Leonard can't get back to guard LeBron who takes Manu right down to the post. That forces Splitter to rotate to help and Neal slides down to help Splitter. All is well until Splitter puts his arms down and LeBron throws a bullet right on target. Miller knocks it down. With this game already out of hand, it's time for LeBron to put his final stamp on the game. Parker finally found his pocket pass and Ray Allen should be farther over to guard the roll. Inexplicably, Kawhi Leonard is in the slot, not in the corner where he should be, allowing LeBron to be in much better position to help. Splitter goes up and his dreams get crushed. I don't like how LeBron celebrates for five seconds, but he does get back into the play, screens the ball, and Danny Green should be at least two steps over to his left, but he gets caught out of position and LeBron throws a frozen rope on the money, game over. So there you have it sports fans. Make sure to visit bballbreakdown.com for the companion article because we'll have lots of extra stats about the Heat half court offense. It was very encouraging because Coach Bolstra definitely changed the game plan, added some wrinkles that we showed you and cut down on five out. And when they did run five out, it was much more efficient. So it's a really great sign for the Heat fans to see that they noticed what wasn't working, what was getting them poor shots, and adjusting accordingly. And I believe that helps with their defense. It gets them more energy when you get good shots, you get your better position to get back on defense. It's a lot of things related to that. So that's good stuff to see. And I don't know if Tim Duncan and Manu are going to play as poorly as they did in Game 2 again. So that's going to be a reason for optimism for the Spurs, but they're going to have to figure out how to guard that LeBron ball screen at the elbow. That said, we've seen the Heat run something that works and then not run it at all the next game. So we'll have to wait and see if they can continue to do that. But there's going to be, have to be a, a serious adjustment by the Spurs defense to handle that. I'm anxious to see what Coach Popovich will do. Don't forget our post-game show coming up after Game 3. It will be a great one. Get on Twitter and get an, and interact with us. I will respond to just about every tweet I get. And don't forget, at B-Ball Breakdown, we're not a channel, we're a conversation. You win, 